just want to say thank you for you being here this morning. It is a pleasure to be able to bring the gospel. I believe one of the greatest things that uh, God has ever given me the privilege to do, and uh, I'll be using this a little later in the service, so uh, we're not going to tie anybody up or force you to come to the altar or anything like that. But uh, this, I just want to say thank you to our senior pastor for allowing me this opportunity. And uh, today we're going to talk about family. And, uh, and like they said, we're going to be wrapping up the We Family series, and, uh, or We. And, uh, but uh, I've been blessed by this entire series, and I hope that you have as well. Uh, I, I was mentored by a senior pastor, Pastor Mike Sane, so uh, I'm going to try to stay on schedule because uh, I have a tendency, if I'm not, to go a little long-winded, and I learned from him, I guess, so... Uh, but uh, I do want, if you're still here and you would love to be an ace track, feel free. They're having an awesome time back there. I had the privilege of teaching the first class last week, and we just had an awesome time. And don't think that you're going to miss this, because we're going we're gonna to give you a link and get it on CD if you don't have internet, and you can see the entire service if you go to ace track. How many of you in here today, though, you have just had this time in your lives that you felt like you were a bad parent. I know I have. But I've come to encourage you. I've come to make you feel better. There's this gentleman named Thomas Hansen of Boulder, Colorado. And he sued his parents for $350,000 on the grounds of malpractice of parenting. Mom and dad had botched his upbringing so badly, he charged in the suit that he would need years of costly psychiatric help. So <laughs> maybe you feel a little better that your kids have not sued you. Uh, I will tell you this, though, as a, as, a, as a youth pastor, parents, be really nice to your teenagers. Be really nice to your children. They will choose the facility that you have to live at when you get older. So... Be nice. They will have the last laugh if you're not careful. But this morning, uh, I just really want to dive right into uh, the We series, uh, We Family. And uh, do y'all ever remember this wonderful marketing scheme that Staples come out? And it was called the Easy Button. Y'all remember that? How many of you in here? can remember, though, like they had these horrible problems. Like they, 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 their, their office was going crazy, and they could just hit this button, and bam, all the problems went away. How many of you wish you had an easy button when you were raising children? Amen? I, I know uh, I, I've got a, I'm, a, I am blessed to be a father to a wonderful four-year-old, and that's the good one. Make sure they don't ever see this sermon because uh, they'll probably resent me. But then I got this other little one. She's about 17 months old, and she's a firecracker. She's redheaded, and she sometimes can be mean. And you know what? The other day, though, I was laying in bed. My wife was there. And I just rolled over, and I looked her in the eyes, and I said, Honey, I want you to know. If I knew you was this bad when you was a baby, I would have never married you. <laughs> I ain't lying. I promise you. But the truth is, she's got a red hair for a reason. She probably gets it from her dad. But, you know, I, I'm young in this whole parenting thing. And, listen, I want to put a disclaimer. I'm not coming here to tell you how to parent because I don't know how to myself. I really don't. Every day I get up and I pray, Jesus, just help me make it through it. Make me brave. Make me brave. <laughs> But I, I, what I am coming to do, I'm coming to tell you what the Word of God says about the family. And I'm going to tell you that I had great parents. I had parents that showed me the way. And so I don't want you to, if you're, if you're in here and you got teenagers, listen, I got them on Sunday and that's enough. <laughs> but I want you to know that, that, I want you to give yourself a big hand clap right now. Just give yourself a big hand clap. Because you know why? You're here. You're here, and you got your kids here, so you are better 
And I don't like to talk about the world, but you are better than a lot of people because you've got them in the place that can change their life forever. So I just want to say thank you for you coming. You, you listen. When you got up this morning and made a decision to come here, you you were parent of the year, parent of the day for some of you. <laughs> so, but you know, I, as I began to think about this easy button, I began to think about some of the stories that I could tell you. And I remember one time. Oh, if you've ever been to a restaurant and you heard a screaming child. There's a, like a 98% chance it was mine. My child has seen every bathroom in Camden County in a restaurant, and it's not for the reason they wanted to use the restroom. Because Daddy believes in discipline. Amen. Yeah, you give a big hand clap. Yeah. But I told my I told my wife with uh, Kennedy, she's our youngest. I said, it just seems like the more I spank her, the worse she gets. You know. And uh, are we believe in discipline? There we go. We want to be politically correct there. So, <laughs> But I, I can remember, though, when Braylee was just a young kid. She was about like two, just learning. She had learned to walk pretty good. And we were bringing groceries in the house. And uh, we got almost all the groceries in the house, and we were starting to put them up. And usually you hear the screaming child or there. And I was like, Where, where's, where's Braylee? And then I heard... Beep, 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 beep. I was like, and we live on Highway 40. And so my heart like went to my kneecaps. And I was like, and I took off running. I dropped whatever I had in my hand. I ran outside, and, and Jack and Ashley Smock had pulled into our driveway because Braley had made it about halfway out into our yard. And you know what? I wanted an easy button right then. My heart was hurting. Because I cared so much about this wonderful gift that God had given us. And I cherished it. And you know, sometimes in life, though, we can wish that we had an easy button. But how many of you know, as much as we wish we could push that easy button in our, in our raising our children, or maybe you're here today and you don't have children, just in life in general, you wish you could hit the easy button. Maybe it's in your finances, you wish you could hit the easy button. But the truth is, there is no easy button. But there is a Jesus. Amen? There is a Savior that loves us. And you know, all joking aside, raising a family, a godly family, in this generation can be one of the toughest things that you ever set out to do. But it is one of the most rewarding things if you do it the way God intended it to be. Before I'm ever a pastor to you, I will first have to be a pastor to my two daughters and my lovely wife. Amen? And so, dads... Mothers, remember, you are the preacher of your home. You are the one. Jensen Franklin tells a story one time of, he said that, uh, and I guess this is a pastor joke, I guess. He said this family come and brought their 15-year-old son to him and just pushed him in his office. He said, you got to do something with him. Jensen looked at him. He said, you mean to tell me you've had him for 15 years and you couldn't do nothing with him, but you want me to? <laughs> so I'm just telling you, parents, it's hard, but it is worth it. If you're going to raise a family in this generation, if I could kind of give a tagline for my sermon here today, is do what is right over what is easy. Do what is right over what is easy. If you're going to raise a godly family, it's not going to be easy. There's no easy buttons. There's nothing we can push. And every day, we're going to have to get up and we're going to have to ask God to take us to where we can only go. His grace has got to lead us every day. But, you know, I was raised by godly parents, and it was hard for them. Many of my teenagers laugh at me when I tell them this, but my wife and, and my friends can attest to this. My dad, was, he was stern in, in a lot of things. But he always had this motto. He said, son, you've got 11 o'clock curfew. You remember when Channel 4 News come on, it was like, do you know where your children are? He used to love that tagline because he knew where his children were. I had a curfew at 11 o'clock. And I had that curfew until the night before I got married. I promise. I promise. But you know what? I thank my dad every day. You know why? I'm not up here to boast. I never touched alcohol. I never touched drugs. I never smoked a cigarette. And I married the love of my life. Amen. (laughs) 
And it wasn't because I read a lot of Bible scripture. I'm just going to be honest. It's because I had a dad that he chose what was right over what was easy. He could have been like every other parent, and I used to tell him, Dad, why can't you be like the rest of the parents? They don't really care if their kids come home at 12 o'clock, at 1 o'clock. He said, Son, I know this. Nothing good happens after 11 o'clock. <laughs> Amen. That's true about that. That's, that's good preaching. If you didn't come for nothing else, you got that. So. And all the teenagers are probably going to boycott tonight's service. It's all right. And I remember, though, no, I, I, I was... Dad had me there, and, 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 he, and we always had it. My, my dad, I had an open relationship with him. I remember my relationship with my dad so much that one time I had lied to him. Yeah, it was bad. And I was so scared that me and him, we were washing dishes together. And remember, I, I read this in study this week. No man, has been, no man has ever been shot while washing dishes. They cannot find it. <laughs> no man has ever been killed while washing dishes. So husbands, if you want to save yourself, wash dishes. <laughs> but I remember we was washing dishes and the conviction in my heart. I was like, I was like, man, I, I, was, I was so nervous. I had the butterflies in my stomach. And, and finally I was like, Dad, I just can't take it no more. I was like, Dad, the other day I lied to you. When you told me that I shouldn't be on the phone, I was on the phone. And... I shouldn't have been. He said, I know. He said, I was just waiting for you to tell me. And you know what? It built a trust and a relationship that, no, he didn't. He could have disciplined me and could have made it worse. But he understood that there was a level of trust I needed in that relationship. And my dad is my hero. My stepmom is my hero because they chose what is right over what is easy. And we live in a generation. And I'm just coming to tell you, we live in this generation. It's almost become an epidemic that, 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 we have been captured by this thing of just do enough. It's coming to the church sometimes. It's coming to our families. It's, it's just do enough. You know, just do the status quo. Don't push against opposition. You know, don't be too hard on your kids. Just go with the flow. But can I tell you this? When you choose easy, you allow your children to choose easy. We're going to raise this generation of God-fearing families in this 21st century. We'll have to choose what is right over what is easy. This morning, I want to show you a few characteristics of a man in the Bible that he led an entire country, led an entire nation to freedom. And I just want us to look at it and see how we can lead our family to freedom. So if you got your Bible, we're going to talk about Moses here this morning. I don't know about you, but what I'm about to read is some good reading. And it's going to blow your mind because I like reading the Message Bible. Uh, I understand it a little better. I graduated from Camden County High School, so uh, King James Version is a little tough. So if you got your Bible, I'm going to ask you to turn to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23 through 27. And it says, by faith. Moses, when grown, refused the pri privileges of the Egyptian royal house. Let me go back. I, I messed up there. I started at 24. 23. By an act of faith, Moses' parents hid him away for three months after his birth. They saw the child's beauty. Kind of like my parents did. And they braved the king's decree. By faith, Moses, when grown, refused the privileges of the Egyptian royal house. He chose a hard life with God's people rather than an opportunistic life, soft life of sin with the oppressors. He valued suffering in the Messiah's camp far greater than the Egyptian wealth because he was looking ahead. All right, this right here, this is, this is some game-changing word right here, anticipating the payoff. By an act of faith, he turned his heel on Egypt, indifferent to the king's blind rage. 
Listen, if you want a passage that you need to highlight and make, make a, a life passage, it's right there. He had his eyes on the one no one can see and kept right on going. If you're going to raise a family in this generation, you're going to have to look to the one you cannot see. Amen? Oprah can't give it to you. Dr. Oz ain't going to help you. And even the pastor, if you bring him here, we can't help you. But Jesus can. Amen? So let me finish there. And by an act of faith, he kept the Passover feast sprinkled, Passover blood on each house so that, when, so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch them. This morning, we're going to talk about Moses and how Moses, what he chose for a nation is what we can choose for our family. The first thing I, I want to tell you here this morning, the first characteristic that we're going to look at this morning is this. He was chose by God. If you're, going to, if you're a note taker, that's the, first, that's the first point tonight. He was chose by God. Can I help you in here? Can I help you? Every single one of you are chose by God. Amen? I remember the first day me and Ashley left the hospital. They give you more training on a forklift than they do on children. <laughs> Literally. Three days. They walked us outside, told us to pull the car up, and you know what they did? To, they buckled the child in. Hallelujah. I looked at Ashley. I said, this thing don't have. We can't take it back. Are we going to be able to do this? Uh, yes. God chose us. He chose us to be parents. So many times I, I see parents that you're going through life and you feel like you can just make it. God chose you. You are the fit for your child. Most of, you, most of you are counting yourself out because you're looking at yourself through your eyes. But you need to look, through, look at yourself through God's eyes. And you know what? When he, when he allowed that conception to happen and he allowed that baby to come into this world, I can remember the first diaper ever changed. It look, you ever watch Shrek? You remember the stuff he likes to bathe in? That's what it looked like. I'm just, y'all, I want y'all to get a visual. We're going to touch all characteristics of learning here. Y'all better go out and tell them to put a slide on. But I remember, I remember, I was like, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can do this. And, you know, I tried the husband thing. Honey, you know, that's a girl. I think you should change her and. We have a boy. I'll change the boy. <laughs> yeah, Jesus. I got two girls, so uh, <laughs> how'd that work out for you, Josh? <laughs> but you are chose by God. So you know what? Encourage yourself. Get up in the morning and say, you know what? God chose me to be a parent. Maybe you don't have kids. Get up and say, God chose me to be a fiance. God chose me to be a mother. God chose me to be a wife. Because you know what? None of this happens by accident. It's by divine design. You know, I just love what Psalms 38, 138, 8 says. It says, The Lord will fulfill His purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. God is going to fulfill His purpose for us. But I love that this passage of Scripture begins to paint this amazing picture of the life and the redemption of Moses. It says that Herod had sent out a decree that all Hebrew children had to be killed. But it says Moses' mama. Everybody say Moses' mama. Some of, like, some of you, she protected her child as long as she could, three months. And she made this basket. To protect him. It's kind of like some of you mamas. You, you, you're doing stuff to protect your children. Don't stop praying for them. Just keep believing. They're going to come back to the house of God. Don't, don't count it out. You protected them. They, they, they may be in the river with all the crocodiles, and, and they may be out there with all that stuff and all the sin, but remember, you covered them. 
You covered them in prayer. You covered, you, you, you the one that went in there when they didn't even know it and you anointed their pillows. You done it. You protected them, mama. So she protected little, little baby Moses. Can we call him little baby Mo? That's, I just read the Bible a little different what I tell our teenagers. So baby Mo was floating down the river. Maybe, maybe, because he was, they said he was a beautiful child. Maybe, maybe he was singing. Blessed be the name. I can't sing, so I ain't even going to try. Maybe, maybe like Adam over there, sing just sound heavenly. The little baby got caught in the bushes there. Pharaoh's daughter, down there taking a bath. Oh, Jesus. There's a baby in the bushes. What the world? So she eases down there and picks up little baby Mo. It's going to be all right. You get to come to the king's house tonight. Takes him back home. Y'all ready for some life? Y'all remember that commercial? About to blow your mind. Gets him back into the house of Moses. And guess who the nanny is? Mama. Because God has a way of bringing them back to you when you prepare them the right way. And so God chose you. He began to show us this redemptive plan in the life of Moses. And I just want to tell some of you, you kind of counted out what maybe Jesus said he would do, fulfill his promise. But I just want to let you know that God is not only a promise maker, but he is a promise keeper. Amen? So Moses' mom sent him down the river, and God knew before he was ever born that he was going to free a nation from the bondage of sin. And I just believe in here under the sound of my voice, some of you got some children back there in, in crew, and some of them you got back there in the nursery, that they're going to free a generation, that they're going to be the next people that stand in the pulpit to preach the gospel. They're going to be the next one that tickles the keyboard over here. Because this is why. Because God chose you to be the parent. He chose you to be the daddy. He chose you to be the mama. You see, some of you have been asking, how did we we land up at the harbor? They're a bunch of crazy folks. I mean, got them lights and all that crazy stuff. Crazy. Pastor's wife is really crazy. Amen. Hallelujah. But you know what? All a part of God's plan. You're here for a reason. God's going to do something great in your life. God chose you. It wasn't by accident. You just didn't show up. You wasn't just happenstance. Mom and daddy might have been in the back seat doing what they shouldn't have done. But you ain't no accident. It's called divine design. He's got a plan for you. Hold on. If you ever want to do anything great in the kingdom of God, I promise you this, or in, even in your family, or even in your marriage, or some of you teenagers, even in, even in your school, or even at college, if you're ever going to do anything great for God, you will first have to understand this, that God has put a purpose in your life. You will never make it without understanding that you have a purpose in your life. It's like, it's like pulling back the arrow and don't know what you're shooting at. But when you have a purpose, you know what a purpose does? It allows me to get up in the morning when my kids are acting crazy. It allows me to get up in the morning and do what God's called me to, even though my finances don't look like it matches up. We're still talking about family. Because all this begins to work for us. You see, Dad, I want you to understand, Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's all he is here for. He's not here to be your buddy. He's not here to make you feel good about yourself. Oh, but he'll tell you lies so that he can steal, kill, and destroy. So, Dad, don't don't let that sin come in. Don't let the sin enter through you. Mom, don't hold unforgiveness. Don't, don't be mad because of what your mom did. Let it go. Because you know what you do? You give the next generation 
the chance, the opportunity to hold on to the pain, to the bitterness, to the anger. Son, get rid of the anger. It ain't worth it. Stop punching holes in the wall. Just read the Bible. That's practical preaching. Young lady, stop doubting that God has his hand on you and that he's called you and that you're great and that you're mighty and that you're beautiful. You know, one of the, ma- one of the things that uh, God has always put in my heart to do, every time, I, every time God lays it on my heart or every time I get up, I'll just go in there and I'll lay my hand on top of Braley's head and i said, there is awesomeness in you. There is greatness in you. And one day it will come out and you will be a deliverer and you will be great and you will be mighty. Because I want to tell you something, parents. Stop talking down on them and start lifting them up. Tell them what they're going to be and not what they can't be. Amen? So, the first characteristic is that Moses was chose. The second characteristic was that Moses made a right choice. In the life of a true Christian, you will understand this, that you will have to choose what is right over what is easy. It's not going to come easy, my friend. You know, it's not always the most popular thing to do. I remember me and Ashley were on vacation this November, and uh, Kennedy was, whew, she was a handful that day. We were at Golden Corral, and uh, we had already taken her to the restroom twice and gave her discipline. We'll leave it at that. And she just reached up and grabbed a plate, and I mean, she just threw stuff everywhere. And I seen the fire in my wife's eyes. Ashley's a little more docile. I have, like, this much patience. So I seen Ashley just grab her up. She disciplined her right there at the table. Because usually we'll take them away. You know, we believe in not humiliating them, but taking them back to the restroom and doing it properly. But that wasn't working. She was not understanding. And some lady looked at Ashley. And I thought Ashley was about to say, You want some too? (laughs) She didn't know. She did. I looked at her. I said, Ashley. She said, Listen, this is my child. I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to do what's right over what's easy. That ain't what she said, but that's really in context of what she was saying. You know what? I'm going to do what's right, and though you stand over there and you look at me and you think I'm crazy, you know what? When this child's 16 years old and I tell her she ain't going somewhere, she knows what it means because at this age, I gave her a whipping. This may not be the one to put on the website. You know, it's so easy for us to choose out of a flesh but forget about a kingdom mindedness. When we look at the life of Moses, we begin to see that he could have chosen the easy way. He could have chose to to be in Egypt. I mean, he was the king's grandson. I mean, I just began to think of it like he could have had like the he could have had the chariot with the 22-inch spinners on it. You get what I'm saying? He could have he could have been rolling. I mean, with the system, the big system, kind of kind of like Tyler's system. Uh, that's one of our teenagers. He's got an awesome sound system. Y'all should listen to it sometime. You know, he could have he could have chosen this life of ease. He could have had all the ladies. He could have had all the power. But Moses was looking for the payoff is what the Message Bible says. He was looking for what's coming later. He was looking for what God's going to do later on in his life. And sometimes we got to make decisions, not how we feel right now, but what God wants to do later. Maybe your children are having a tough time right now, but do what's right over what's easy because there's going to come a day, there's going to come a time, and I, be- I believe this to the core of my belief. If you will do the way, if you'll do it the way God says it, he will reward it. You know, but he knew his purpose, and his purpose affected his choices. 
You'll have to make a choice, my friend. It'll be one side or the other. The Bible tells us that Jesus, he said, hypocrites, those that are hot and cold, I will spew them out. They're lukewarm. Parents, there's a call for us in here this morning to say, I know the rest of my friends will call me a radical. I know people will look at me and they will say I'm crazy, but God, I am doing what you told me to do. I'm going to have my children in the house of God. I don't care if they kick, scream, and and, want to hold themselves in. They're going to be in the house of God because I know this, that there is a man there and his name's Jesus, and if I can just get him in his presence, he can change his life. So, Daddy, you ease into the bedroom pray over that room it's a choice you have to make will you leave work early and just take the kids to the park dad will you ease over to the high school and just take that young lady on a date give her a rose show her what true love really looks like that it's not in sex and not in showing yourself and not in parties. But it's a love that will last forever. I know. I want to I, I say just thank you to Cherie and Chris for the father-daughter dance. If you didn't have an opportunity to go to that dad's, please, next year, go. My daughter loved it. The whole way home, all she was talking about, Daddy, thank you for dancing with me. Yeah. Thank you. You know, I took her out to eat. Eat anything you want. I know that's probably not good parenting. But <laughs> when you got a daddy this size, <laughs> it's kind of hard to say no. I'm working on it. But moms, will you, will you choose to love your husband maybe unconditionally maybe he don't wash the dishes maybe he don't pick up his clothes (laughs) maybe maybe he don't do those things but can I just speak to you real quick from my and Adam if you'll Mom, can I tell you something? Children, I'm not asking for pity, and I know none of these men in here are either. But being a dad's tough. At the end of every day, it feels like the stress of life resides on these. Will I have enough money to send my children to college? I got two girls. Will I have enough to give them the wedding that they desire. I live in a world, we live in a world where every corner and every path we see somebody else walking away from the church. We see somebody else's child leave. You know what? It sets a lot here. So Ma, maybe Dad don't pick up his clothes like he should. I know. He should. Maybe Really, maybe, maybe he should do more with the kids. But telling him how bad he is ain't going to do it. Look him in the eye and say, I love you. And you are amazing. You are important. You are my hero. I tell you why? Because you mean the most to us. I don't care how many people pat us on the back in the job and tell us that we're great. I don't care how many people post on Facebook and say that we're awesome. When you can look your husband in the eye and 
husbands, you need to do it in your wives too. Just tell him you're beautiful. You're hotter today than the first day I met you. It's that is what we need to hear. Kids, go home. Clean up your room. <laughs> Without being told. And go wrap your arms around daddy. And just tell him thank you. Because I can tell you this. So the home goes, so the church goes. So if we've got strong dads, we've got strong, we've got strong wives, we can make it. Hell can come against us all it wants. But it's not against a person. It's against the church. If you're standing here today, the last and final characteristic that Moses showed us was this. kept his commitment just a few moments I'm going to ask you to come down here and I'm going to ask you to pray because I believe the presence of God is here this morning you're going to have an opportunity to make a commitment to say God maybe I got it wrong maybe I chose the easy way over the right way. Today, today, I make a commitment. I make a commitment to come back to you, Jesus. I make a commitment to come and, and, and to give it all back to you, God. Because you see, Moses made the decision. I was telling brother, Pastor Eric, most people think Moses left Egypt, went to the wilderness, seen a burning bush, and came back the next day. Scripture tells us it's almost 40 years. And I believe it was this, that Moses had to make a commitment and stick with it. Though your circumstances, listen guys, if you don't get nothing else out of this message, do not let your circumstances waver your commitment. Maybe your children are not in the house of God. Do not waver your commitment. Maybe your children are crazy. Do not waver your commitment. Maybe your, maybe your marriage is on the rocks at this moment right now. Do not waver your commitment. You said, I do, through the good, through the bad, through it all. I made a commitment to her, and I'm going to stick to it, my friend. You know why you need to make a commitment, my friends? My family. Francis Chan used this illustration and thought it was real. This is our life. This is the David says that almost 70 years. That's what David says. Some of us more, some of us less. making choices that are easy over right for these 70 years. Don't, don't, look at, don't look at life through 70 years. What you do this is eternity. It goes on and on, it would stretch all around the world, never ending. So, my friend, the commitment is not for tomorrow. The commitment's not for next week. You tell her no, she can't go to the party. It's for eternity. When you tell her that you love her, but you're just not going to fund the habit. It's for eternity. Husbands, when that pretty little girl at the office 
looks like a temptation. Commitments, not for 70 years. It's for eternity. Dad, when everybody's asleep, get online. Those images, telling kids, it's okay. It's okay. It's destroyed. not for this. It's for this. Heads bowed and eyes closed here today. I want to ask you this question. Would you? I know. I know what I feel in my my heart right now. I know that there are couples. There are families. You wish you could hit an easy button because life is hard. Your kids are they're not here. But you know, today, as I was coming in this morning, I just felt the presence of God saying, the prodigal son is coming home. And I just wanted to encourage some of you that you maybe you come here this morning and maybe you didn't know what it was all going to be about, but God has come to let me let you know that there is prodigals that are going to come home because you were chosen to be their parent and you made some good choices and you held on to your commitment. Do not waver. Maybe you're here today. And maybe you've made some bad decisions. Maybe you've made some bad choices. Maybe your life is not where you thought it would be. Maybe your marriage is on the rocks and you don't know how you're going to make it. Maybe your children just don't know how. You just don't know how to fix the problems. You don't know how to, you don't know how to make it go away tell you today. There's no easy button at this altar, but there's a Savior. He loves you. He cares for you. And I believe today, if you'll step out of your seat and you'll move to this altar, I believe the Savior of the entire universe will come and He will mend your broken heart. He will mend he will mend back those, those relationships that's been torn apart. He will begin to give you strength. He will begin to give you courage if you're here today. Maybe you're a husband and wife, and maybe you just need to let each other know you love them. You love each other. If you're here today, as I count to three, I'm going to ask you to step out of your seat, and I'm going to ask you to move this way. Because I believe the presence of God is here to do something great and do something mighty. If you want change in your life, if you want change in your family, if you want to know that God is going to sustain you through it all, I want you to begin to move out of your seat and move down to this altar when I get to count to three. One, two, three.